Good evening. Welcome to First Baptist Church this evening. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we've got a great service in store, and we're going to start with a chorus called Just Over in the Glory Land. And uh, something a little bit later on in the service, musically, that we haven't done in quite a while. So something in store for you after we do a little bit of singing here at the beginning. Let's stand and sing, Just Over in the Glory Land. Just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band. Just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, there will the mighty host not stand. Just over in the glory land, just over. Marching to Zion, another great hymn out of our hymnal. Let's keep singing this evening. We're marching to Zion. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne. As you can see, uh, our theme is uh, pointing us towards singing about heaven. I'm home beyond the river. Let's keep singing tonight. Oh, the blessed contemplation, when with troubles here I sigh. to see you all tonight. However, how, is everybody ready for Thanksgiving? Let me just tell you something. 46 million turkeys are given their lives so we can have Thanksgiving this year. 40% of the mushrooms, cream of mushroom soup that Campbell's will sell will happen this week. 40%. And that's all for that green bean casserole everybody makes for every cotton-picking Thanksgiving turkey. 
80 million tons of cranberries will be consumed this Thanksgiving, and some of that will be translated into 5,062,000 gallons of everybody's favorite cranberry jelly. That stuff in the can that comes out just like it. You ever wonder, why does it look like the can? How do they get in there and do that? Well, there you go. Some fun facts. Good to see some smiles on your face. What I do hope most of all is that you are truly grateful and thankful for what God has done for us and how he looks after us. No matter how bad our lives are, we can always rejoice in the Lord, knowing we have a secure future in him. And so thank you for being here this morning, or this afternoon. Heavenly Father, we are grateful and thank you. We thank you for so many things. We thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace. And Lord, we thank you for salvation. Thank you for the fact, God, that we can come and worship in our house of, of, uh, of worship here tonight. And I pray now that you would just help us as we gather around your word. We pray now that you'll be with Brother Barry as he travels. Give him safety. May he enjoy his time off. I pray for Brother Allen as he brings the message. Give him clarity of thought and clarity of speech. We love you, God, in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Brother Barry is on the way on his vacation. So pray for him as he travels. Uh, he's going to make it all up to about Atlanta, hopefully tonight, and then go from Atlanta into Tennessee, where they're going to be spending almost about 10 days or so. He gets to see his newest grandson for the very first time. I don't know who's more excited, him or Miss Vicky. No, I know who's more excited, all right? I do know who's more excited. But thank you for everybody who prayed for that little guy. Jackson is doing well, and we're grateful for that. And so thank you for coming. If this is your very first time to be with us here at First Baptist Church or our first time in a long time, would you do us a favor? Raise your hand. Get the attention of one of these four gentlemen as they walk past you. All right. I don't see anybody raise their hands. I just want to see these guys walk to the front and get their steps in for the day. So there you go. Thank you, fellas. And we're in for a treat. Uh, Brother Barry has asked uh, Alan Waddell to speak for us. And so we appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that we have several men in this church who can bring the word of God to us so Brother Barry can go and have some time off. He's really, really been uh, working diligently and hard on a lot of different things, and some of it uh, some folks are just not aware of. It doesn't matter. He needs this time off, and I'm glad that he's getting away. So you pray for them while they're gone, and you guys, if I don't see you again, you have a blessed Thanksgiving. Josh? So for tonight's missionary updates is actually a missionary that I know quite well, my sister-in-law, Amber Yingling. Uh, I will I have to admit, I do have the inside track on this one. Amy calls Amber very, fairly regularly, uh, and uh, a lot has happened. There's at least three pages of text, and I will be reading all of it word for word tonight. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I will give you the cliff notes, but a lot has really happened in Amber's a life in the Philippines, serving there with the Ocampos. Uh, one thing is she had a chance to visit two orphanages uh, there where she's at and looking to partner with one of them in the future and actually work and serve there. The first one is the Philippine Baptist Orphanage. It's uh, been around for six years and has almost 100 children. And she told us that that particular orphanage, the children are a little bit rougher and they do not have as many workers as they would like to have. So there's definitely a good need there. And they, she also got the chance to uh, visit Subic Bay Children's Home, which has been in operation for over 30 years and has 50 children as well. So two great ministry opportunities there. Do uh, pray with her as she sees where God would have her serve in the future. Uh, right now she uh, just got finished helping out at a youth camp, working as a nurse. She was able to use some of the nursing knowledge that she learned here in the States, over there in the Philippines, and that was very valuable. Um, right now, she's also going through language studies. She has a new teacher, and she's getting to that point where the language is beginning to click with her, but uh, she does ask us to pray that uh, her memory, her ability to recall faster uh, would uh, increase, especially as she takes uh, more tests and quizzes over the language. Now, the last thing that she asks us to pray for is a very important aspect of being a missionary. Because when you go to a foreign country for an extended period of time, they, some for some reason, want a visa and not the credit card, though I'm sure they would appreciate that. 
Uh, but this visa is, she's on a missionary visa right now, and she can renew it in country for up to five years. So now is that time that she's getting all that paperwork together to send to the government. So do uh, pray that her visa, everything goes well with the paperwork, and she's able to get that back in a timely manner and get that approved. Let's go ahead and lift uh, Amber in pr- up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Amber and her ministry there to the uh, Philippines and to some of the youth there at the youth camp as well as serving with the Ocampos in the church. She has several prayer requests, Lord. I do pray that you would give her clarity to uh, determine your will for her in her future ministry, that you help her with her memory recall as she learns the Filipino language, but that uh, you also would expedite this process of getting her visa approved and that she might be able to stay and continue the wonderful ministry that you've given to her there. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
It's fellowship time. This is what we normally do. Choir comes down, everybody greets and shakes hands and has a moment of fellowship time. But I'm going to give you a little bit of homework during your fellowship time. After fellowship time, we're going to have a few minutes of congregation choice hymns. So while you have your fellowship time, if you want to find a song that's your favorite out of the hymnal, or one that we haven't heard in a long time, or both, or whatever, that would be good. Those, those blue foldy things in the, in the pews, they still work. But now here's the rules. There are three rules. Number one, stick into the blue hymnal. Uh, that's what we're familiar with. If you stump the director, you have to come direct. If you stump the pianist, not likely. If you stump the pianist, you have to come play. Okay, so there's your, there's your ground rules. After fellowship time, we'll pick a few and enjoy some congregation choice. But right now, go ahead and have a time of fellowship. Uh, yeah, why don't you go ahead and have a seat? That, that we can uh, we can we can do that for this portion. Uh, raise your hand if you have found one of your favorites. Uh, Ashley Howard, I see. Surely, goodness and mercy is three sixty nine. And all of these, we will probably just sing the first verse. And there we go. Um, Vanessa Oni's back there, uh, fast fingers on the computer, and we give our instruments time to find it in the book. Surely, goodness and mercy. Here we go. A pilgrim was I and a wandering in the cold night of sin I did roam when Jesus the kind shepherd found me. and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. All right, right down front, Miss Green. Because he lives, I believe that is 238. Yes, 238, because he lives. And we are there. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and Savior lives. 
sir, right about halfway back. Sorry? Heaven came down. Heaven came down, I believe, is 525 in the book. I'm three for three. I'm, I'm impressing myself. I, I thought for sure I'd, I'd mess something up by now, but not too bad. 525, heaven came down. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. Spelling with joy, I am telling he made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. for about two more. Uh, yes, ma'am, behind Mr. Waddell. 541. Is that in the garden? Yes. In the garden. 541. In the garden. There it is. I come to the Since I ignored Alan, I will go to Amy Waddell. Go ahead. 370 verse 3. That's, that's specific. 370 verse 3. I'm thinking I know. <laughs> I, I, four for five. Not too bad. So day by day, and this is verse 3. Help me then in every tribulation. So to trust your promises, O oh Lord, that I lose not faith's sweet consolation offered me within your holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, ere to take as from hand one by one the days the moments fleeting till I reach the promised land all right well thank you so much for playing along uh, we may do that again next week so if I didn't call on you come on back next week uh, for another chance Right now we're going to go to 479, which is face-to-face -face with Christ my Savior. And we're going to get ready to receive the offering. Gentlemen, go ahead and come. Just one verse here. Face-to-face -face with Christ my Savior. Face-to-face, -face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ to shall behold him far beyond the 
Just have two words for Robert, show off. <laughs> Although he said, what'd you say, four out of five? Four out of six. No, four out of six. The last song, he had to glance to see the title. He knew the number, and it was on here. All right, I, I'm, I'm throwing you under the bus, brother. I watched it. He went. <laughs> really, really appreciate Robert and his ministry. He's done a great job for us here in this five years. Six? Uh, six? Six. So we're blessed to have talented people like Robert who uh, are really helping us in the ministry here. Very quickly, um, don't forget, no Wednesday night service. Everybody say, no Wednesday night service. We do that so that you can stay at home with your family. You can start prepping for Thursday. Uh, make that a family day. There, when we do when we don't have services, it's for the specific reason to allow you to spend time with your family. So please, let me encourage you to uh, do that. If you don't have family, let me encourage you uh, to invite somebody over to your house for the dinner. Or if you know somebody who doesn't have family, invite them over. My wife and I have done that for years. We can't invite everybody. All right, don't be calling my house. Don't call the office and say, hey, what time's dinner? I was very blessed to see Larry Davis here this morning. He's been in a rehab. I don't know when he got out, but it was this past weekend or Friday. Uh, but he, we are glad to see him. Jolene, is Jolene here? No. Oh, there she is. Jolene, when did he get out? Yesterday afternoon. Was blessed to see him. You continue to remember Larry. And then Terry Horton is back from Mexico. Yeah, we prayed for you, brother. Last Sunday you had us all going. So, but I saw pictures, and he didn't let him hold him down. He got back on that boat, and he was catching some fish. And he said, boy, did they pull. All right. Then the last thing before we pray, that if you are traveling this week, please drive safely. If you are not, pray for those who are. Uh, it's just bananas out there on the road. So please, please, please be careful. We want you to come back like you left, safe and sound. Heavenly Father, we've reached our time in our service where we will uh, receive our offering. We will give back what you've already given to us. May we do so faithfully. I am so proud to be part of this church that are so gracious, so faithful in giving and, Lord, I pray that we as a staff would be wise stewards of that money that you, you send to our way. We pray that all of us would do that, be wise stewards of the finances that you give us. Lord, thank you so much for an opportunity to serve you here. We love you, God. Be with Brother Allen once again as he brings the message. We love you, God, in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Purify my heart, wash me with your holiness, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Purify.
Wash me with your holiness. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Purify my heart. I need your presence. Take your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter number 5 this evening, Matthew chapter number 5. And uh, we, are, we are looking into um, this week Thanksgiving, and, and I have a lot to be thankful for. And we have been here for five months now, and um, a little over five months. And I want to say that I am, I am so, we've been embraced, um, people have been so kind to us. Um, people have taken us in and just loved on us. And I want to say I'm thankful for every single member of First Baptist Church of Ruskin, except for Robert O'Neill. Everyone except for him. Did you see what he did? He was like, uh, I, I mean, it was like a sword drill. I guarantee, like, my Bible went up first. You know, my hand went up first. And he's like, this person here and that person here. And the clincher, the clincher was when he pointed right at me and said, that woman right behind, Alan Waddell. And so... <laughs> I am thankful for Robert O'Neill. He, 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 he had so much to our church, and I, I love the music here. And so I am kidding about what I said earlier, but I do appreciate every person here. Matthew chapter number 5, if you will. Matthew 5, and we're going to look at the first three verses. And I, I've been kind of going through Beatitudes, and I'm, I'm going completely out of order and I, I figured we better start back at the foundation, the very first one. And so we're going to look at Matthew 5, 1 through 3. And we're going to look at blessed are the poor in spirit. Um, so the Bible says, and seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to hear your word uh, spoken this evening, Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would do exactly what he desires to do in each and every heart this evening, Lord. If there's any that does not know you as your Savior, I pray that he would especially speak to their hearts about salvation. And Father, we do pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So there's a story told of a teenage girl um, in Switzerland who had wandered away from a family camping area in the Alps. And suddenly slipped over a mountainside and dropped to a cannon um, that, that, that would drop to a cannon floor that would be hundreds of feet under her. It would be her death um, if it hadn't been for the fact that there was a uh, there was a tree branch um, that was cut from a tree kind of coming out from the side, and she grabbed a hold of that and held on to it for hours, holding on for dear life. It was at night, and finally the rescuers found her, and when they found her, they found that there was a plateau, a rock plateau, underneath her about six inches away. And she was there hanging the whole time, and six inches from her was safety, that she could have just dropped down and been okay. And I wonder if that sounds like your life this evening. I wonder if you feel like you're just hanging on uh, for dear life as long as you possibly can, but in your heart you have no hope and you really don't know how much longer you can hold on. We get so wrapped up in the stresses of temporal life that we often miss the fact that there is a rock that we could be standing on. There's a rock and his name is Jesus Christ. 
Uh, and so we are hanging on for dear life when Christ is right there. And, you know, God doesn't, he doesn't want us to have a hanging on type of a life. <clears throat> In fact, the Bible tells us that, we, that, that God wants us to have a blessed life. The Bible says he wants us to have an abundant life, a life that's filled with hope and joy in Jesus Christ. He wants us to rest in his sovereignty. Now, we take a stand against the doctrine of prosperity preachers, and I understand that. Uh, God does not promise us that we're going to be healthy and wealthy and everything's going to be great. Um, but I will say this, God does want us to prosper. The only difference between us and the prosperity preachers uh, is the fact that we define prosperity different. Um, they define it as health and wealth and, and, and name it and claim it. We define it as glorifying Christ. That's prosperity to us. And so, uh, God wants us to prosper. Now, um, verse number one intrigues me. It says, he went up into the mountain. And we often think as servants of Christ uh, that we have to meet the needs of every person that comes our way. Remember, and I've mentioned this before, that the crowd's coming to him. And instead of going to the crowd, he goes up into the mountain. Uh, and, and, and that's just what a great example. Uh, we see the example here of Christ going to a mountain just to get away from, from it all, just to get away from it. Now, if Christ did not feel like he had to be everything to every person that came to him, what makes you think you have to be? What makes you think that you have to be everything to every person? And, and I, I think about this. Christ went up into a mountain, um, and, and we, we have churches today that they treat their pastor as if he has to be everything to every person. Um, I, you, if you know history, you know about, how many know about the circuit riding preachers? Okay, the circuit riding preachers, um, they, they would have churches from very far distances, and sometimes they would spend some time, like a month at this church, and then they would ride over to a church way over here, and then they'd ride over to a church way over here. And, and during that time, that, that time that the pastor wasn't with them, that church, the people had to, believe it or not, they had to handle their own problems and trust God and actually help one another uh, they, they, they didn't go around and say, I cannot believe the pastor. I sniffled the other day, and the pastor was not here to give me Kleenex, you know. Um, there's been times, really rough times in our history, where the pastor wasn't always there. And we have to be careful. Sometimes in ministry, if you're serving in ministry, sometimes you get this idea that I have to be everything for everybody, and you don't. And by the way, you're actually hurting them when you, when you feel like you have to. Because when you have the mentality that I have to be everything for everybody, uh, then, then you take the place of God. You're training them to depend on you for everything. And there's a danger in that. Uh, it's actually a form of idol worship. You're actually training them to depend on you instead of on God. You know, we ought to at, at times tell people no. At times we need to tell people you can figure this out with God's help on your own. And that's healthy for them. Dr. Tom Lone Sr. Um, pastored the uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church in Pontiac, Michigan. And uh, he would have people come up to him and say, Pastor, I'd like you to visit a, a family member of mine. Here's, the, here's a card with their name on it. And somebody else would come up and say, would you visit this person? And somebody else would say, would you visit this person? And finally, a pastor had visited and, and preached for Dr. Malone. And he came up to him and he said, you're doing your people a great misservice. And he said, how am I doing that? He said, you're training them to do, that, that, that you're going to do what they're supposed to do. And Dr. Malone started getting, getting cards from people, and they'd say, would you visit this person? Would you visit this person? He'd start putting them in, in his pocket. And then when somebody would come up to him and say, hey, I have somebody, would you visit this person? He'd say, sure, and you visit that person. And somebody else would come, would you visit this person? I would love to. You visit that person. And somebody came up to him and said, what do you think about, about playing cards? He said, that's all we do in our church is play cards. <laughs> we just, I, here, you visit that person, I, I'll visit this person. And the idea is, you're not supposed to be everything for everybody. And even Jesus had that mentality. Here's a bunch of people needing something from him. And he said, you know what, you can wait, I'm going to the mountain. I'm going to spend time up there. And so he does that. And now, we live in a country of shortcuts and fast lanes, and we're busy trying to get things done quickly, and we're on the move, and the next big accomplishment um, that we really find time to get alone with God. And rarely, 
do we have those special times of prayer and communion with our Creator? One of the reasons that we don't spend quality time with God is because we don't believe we can afford the time. Now, if you can't afford time to spend with God, you need, you need to cut some things off. You need to cut some things off and spend some time with God. And so, before Jesus spoke to the masses, he went to the mountain. Before the disciples encountered the crowds, they encountered the Christ. And there's a pattern here. And it was from this mount where Jesus gives us beatitudes. The beatitudes have been described as attitudes that ought to be in a believer's life. Uh, the beatitudes, of course, are part of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount has a twofold application. Uh, first, there's a literal application for the coming kingdom um, when Jesus rules. It's kind of like a type of a constitution type mentality. Second, the Sermon on the Mount explains the type of kingdom God wants uh, to build in the lives of his followers now, today. And the emphasis of the Beatitudes is that God blesses a life of inward character. Many of Jesus' day, especially the Pharisees, believed righteousness was only an exterior matter. It was only something seen on the outside. The Pharisees would brag, like in Luke 11, about the fact that they didn't sin. They fasted and they tithed. Uh, and, and, and by the way, it wasn't true. Everybody sins. And their attitude was that they thanked God that they were not as other men are. But here, Jesus emphasized righteousness from the heart of a believer, and that bothered the Pharisees. And we must never replace the internal with only the external. God wants, and by the way, he deserves both. Really, what, what good is outward obedience if our heart is proud and critical? A true Christian lives not for the approval of men, but to please God from the heart. And so the Beatitudes are not emphasizing self-righteousness. They are really emphasizing grace righteousness. That inner working of God that reconstructs a heart. And so Romans 8, 4, the Bible says, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And so we're going to look at uh, this very first beatitude, the blessed are those that are poor in spirit. And I personally believe there's a sequence with these attitudes. I believe you kind of get them in order. Um, and so uh, you start with the first one, poor in spirit, and it's kind of foundational in nature. Um, it's foundational. You'll never have the other attributes mentioned until you have this one. It's first. And a true illustration of what it is to be poor in spirit is found in the Laodicean church in Revelation 3, which actually had the exact opposite mentality. Uh, the Bible says in Revelation 3.17, because thou sayest, I am rich, that's the opposite of poor, isn't it? So in their spirit, they're saying, I am rich. And increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Uh, the Bible says that if, if you see yourself as rich and increase of goods, God sees you as wretched and poor and miserable and blind and naked. By the way, if you see yourself as poor, then you begin to see how rich you are in Christ. The opposite is true. And so, I want to start off by looking at the definition of poor in spirit. Let's start off there. The definition of poor in spirit. And, uh, and, and by the way, I, I feel pretty good about myself. I am not a PowerPoint person, but I put a PowerPoint together to, um, today. I was, I was so excited about that. And so, here it is. Um, I, 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 you say, what's, what's, what's with the boy that looks like maybe he's surfing? Um, I don't know. I like the color. Um, I thought the color was nice. Um, I, I had nothing spiritual at all about that. Um, I, I, maybe that boy is, uh, he has nothing, but, uh, you know, he has everything in God, God. That's, I don't know, I'm making up. I have no idea what that's about, um, but I'm proud I did a PowerPoint. I'm, I'm proud of that. So I want to notice the definition. Um, let me tell you what it does not mean. It does not mean uh, poor in spirit as we would think. What it really means is humble in spirit. It means knowing yourself, accepting yourself, being who you are um, to the glory of God. Now, when you know yourself, you know your strengths and your weaknesses. Um, I don't know about you, but I have very few strengths and I have a lot of weaknesses. Am I the only one? I have very few strengths. I have a lot of weaknesses. Amy's dad knows about everything you can do with your hands, yeah, mechanics, uh, building houses, whatever that may be. Uh, so what a letdown it must have been when she married me. 
Uh, and over the last few weeks, Pastor Rumsey has learned my, of my limitations. By the way, I've learned of other people's limitations. I've learned this about Josh Cortez. If he's hammering a nail in, he's going to hit his thumb more than the nail. If he ever asks me to hold a nail for him, the answer is no. I am not going to go through that. But you know what? He's, he, he's, he's, he volunteers and he helps, and I appreciate that. I found out that he has a willing heart. And you know, it humbles me when I realize that my weaknesses make me depend on others. It makes me depend on others. So you, you know yourself, I'm weak in these areas, I'm strong in these areas, and you accept yourself. You don't have to pretend to be what you're not. Don't be jealous of what someone else is, how God has blessed them, or God has, has given them abilities and talents, but you understand that God made you, you, on purpose. God maketh no mistakes. He made you exactly how you are on purpose. You are his masterpiece. Uh, you are the right tool for the task that he has designed for you. You are exactly who you're supposed to be. And then be yourself. 1 Corinthians 12, 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Uh, Paul is saying, my, my strength is in my weaknesses. And my weaknesses are in my strengths. And in ourselves, we are bankrupt, but in Christ, we are spiritually rich. A person weak in spirit knows that he must empty himself of self and fill himself of God's spirit. A person who's poor in spirit knows that every place of God's choosing is an important place. Being poor in spirit means that you see yourself as bankrupt of any intellect, any ability, any wisdom, or any other resource that man tends to think they have in themselves. You are poor of these things. Uh, you, you, you are far less than you think you are. I've had people come up to me and say, I'm so useless, and I'm, I, I've sinned so bad, and I'm such a terrible person. And I've said, don't worry, you're much worse than you think you are. We are, aren't we? We are much worse than we think we are. And so we realize that we are bankrupt. Uh, people have asked me what my life verses. My life verse, verses are John 15, 4 and 5. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except to abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. It doesn't say, without me, you can only do certain things. It doesn't say, without me, you're going to rely on the few talents that you might have. No, he says, without me, you can do nothing. And he gives an illustration of the vine and the branch. Uh, and that branch does not produce its own fruit. It actually draws from the vine, which produces it through him. We have nothing of ourselves. All of our resources are in God. All of them are in Christ. And so we're poor but we have resources that are limitless. Uh, the poor in spirit surrenders his will to God. Rather than thinking of God's blessing as a reward of conquest, it's really a blessing for surrender. As I surrender myself and recognize my weaknesses, I'm able to receive the blessings of God. God's blessing is not something we earn by conquest. We only get it by surrender. So how can we know that we're developing inner character or being poor in spirit? Well, I, I've, got, I've got a test for you. I've got a few questions to ask. The first question is this. Do you accept others because you've accepted yourself? Do you accept others because you've accepted yourself. Now, you can accept others because you've accepted yourself. The disciples in Matthew 18, 1, remember, they were arguing. They said, who is the greatest in the kingdom? They were a little high-minded. They all wanted a high position. They all wanted recognition. They all wanted to, to be applauded. And they're were, they were arguing, who's the greatest? I think I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. They had not become poor in spirit. David, when offered Saul's daughter. Remember, uh, for killing Goliath, Saul said, you, you'd have my daughter. And David made this statement. He said, who am I that I should be the son-in-law to the king? David had the right spirit. Who am I? Why, why would God ever do anything for me? David was poor in spirit. In Philippians 2, 5 through 8, the Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. 
took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So love produces humility. Love produces humility. By the way, it's not false humility. Jesus did not pretend to be less than he was, as some people do, as they put on a public display of humility. You know, you see those people, and they're always walking around, woe is me. I'm just a nobody. And they walk around wanting to draw attention to what a nobody they are. Uh, you know, humility doesn't draw attention for, about anything. You don't, have to be, you don't have to pretend to be less than you are. Jesus knew he was equal with God. The Bible says you being in the form of God, thought not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus didn't go around. He was humble as can be. He humbled himself, became a man. But he didn't go around saying, oh, I'm not equal with God. No, he knew he was. Now, by the way, none of us are. But he knew he was equal with God. So humility is not going around pretending you're less than what you are. That's not what humility is. Humility is just not drawing attention to yourself at all. Good or bad, it doesn't make a difference. It's just not drawing attention to yourself. Now, John 13, 3, the Bible says that Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God, he went to God. Now, you should know who you are. You should know who you are in Christ. He knew that the Father had given all things into his hands. He knew what he had. Know that you're of great value. Don't ever pretend to be that this this is not so in in, in the name of false humility. You are of royal blood. You are a prince. You are a priest. You are joint heirs of Jesus Christ. You are somebody. So don't think that being humble means I go around pretending like I'm, I'm valueless. No, you have great value. If you walk around acting as if there's no value to you, that's doctrinally incorrect. You have so much value that Christ paid uh, his own son to to buy you, to to redeem you. You have great value. Uh, A year, last year, maybe maybe earlier this year, I can't remember, but we went, my wife was working for Thrive when we were in um, Illinois. Thrive is an organization that's sole purpose is to, to, to fight Planned Parenthood. And to, and to defeat abortion and to get rid of it all together. And my wife worked for them. And she helped put together a big conference, one of the big uh, regional conferences for the area. Uh, and, and at that conference, there's a woman who spoke there by the name of Gianna, uh, Gianna Jessen. Anybody ever hear that name before? Gianna Jessen's very... Anyone ever watched the movie? It's a Christian movie called October Baby. October Baby was, was made based on the life of Gianna Jessen. Gianna Jessen uh, was an abortion. Uh, Her mom, young girl, went to an abortion clinic. They had uh, a saline abortion. Uh, That that baby just was swimming in in this solution that, that just destroys you and kills you. And was there for hours upon hours, and she should have been dead. I don't think there's ever been a a situation where somebody has survived that except for her. And she was born. And she came out, and and, and at the time that that, that she was lying there, they were just waiting for her to die. They were just waiting on the table. Uh, There was a time uh, in in the night where where, uh, a nurse came by, and there was no doctor there. And usually there'd be a doctor that, I hate that they call them doctors. Doctors heal people. They don't kill people. They're not doctors. But there was nobody there to end this baby's life, so a nurse took that baby and brought it next door to a real hospital where they saved the life of this baby. And she grew up. And she's a great voice against abortion. And, and, and we watched, and she kind of gave her story, and she really, it was a great day. She, she, she gave a, a great speech that day, uh, and, uh, and, and, and she came out, and she said this. She walked out. Now, she has cerebral palsy as, as a result of the saline. She has cerebral palsy, so she walks, and, and she just kind of, you know, it's hard for her to even get there. She has some deformities. She has some things that are unattractive about her. Um, she, she, just a beautiful spirit, though. And she gets up there, and she says, hello, my name is Gianna Jensen, and I'm fabulous. It's the first thing she says. I'm fabulous. And she, and she gave this incredible speech, and it was really great. And there must have been at least ten times where she reminded us that I am fabulous. 
Just, just a wonderful personality. I love that. Now, boy, that sounds arrogant. No. She understood that in Christ Jesus, we're fabulous. In Christ Jesus, we're valuable. In Christ Jesus, uh, God has purpose, and, and, and we don't have to walk around as if we are useless and valueless. We are fabulous in Christ Jesus. So being poor in spirit, you understand that you are who you are only by the grace of God. Uh, and you see, if I don't know who I am, if I don't have uh, my self-assurance in Christ, then it's hard for me to humble myself. You know why? Because I'm afraid I'm going to lose something. If I don't understand that every good and perfect gift comes from above, then I'm afraid I'm going to lose something to you, so I'm going to be mean to you. I'm going to be rude to you because I think I might lose popularity to you. I might lose position to you. I might lose something to you that I want. So if I don't see that everything I have is in Christ Jesus and I am secure in Christ and I have nothing to be insecure about, what I would do is I would treat you poorly and pride will come up because I'm afraid I'm going to lose something. And so we have to understand that. Uh, but if I know that I have something and it's of God and I cannot lose it, I'm not at risk anymore. I, I'm not jeopardizing myself to serve you. Uh, I don't have to grasp or be greedy or to be insecure. I, I don't have to promote myself above you. See, real humility is not thinking lowly of yourself. Real humility is understanding what you are in Christ and therefore being free to serve one another. To serve one another. I love what Adrian Rogers says about that. We have a quote by Adrian Rogers there. Um, and he says this. He said, God accepts me. That's grace. I accept that he accepts me. That's faith. I accept me. That's peace. I accept you. That's love. You accept me. That's fellowship. And it all begins with understanding who I am in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so understanding who you are helps begin that. Now, you are, uh, first question there, very important, um, is do you accept others because you accept yourself? The second one is, are you accepting circumstances? Now, don't be angry or critical when things don't go your way. Philippians 4.11 says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Um. So we don't have to be critical when things don't go our way. We can be content. Change what you can change by God's grace and trust what you can't change. Trust that God has a reason. Someone who is constantly upset with where they are, they're upset with their circumstances, that is a self-centered person. It's someone who's not trusting in the sovereignty of God. Uh, we don't live for our fulfillment. We don't live for our ambition. We don't live for our glory. We don't live for our own happiness. We, we don't live for any of those things. We live for the purpose God has for us, for the glory that God gets. And if we see God as owner of our lives, we can be content with whatever he puts in our path. We can be content. And so are you content? While the Bible speaks of an abundant life, it is on God's terms. My life is abundant because of my walk with God, not because of my circumstances. God wants our lives to be abundant even in the worst circumstances. Romans 8, 28 and 29 are my favorite counseling verses. I love counseling people with this. And we know these verses. For we know that all things work together for what? I mean, we don't know these verses. All things work together for good, right? Um, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, we understand all things work together for good. But what is good? What, what is the meaning of that word good? Verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. You know what the Bible defines as good? Our, our conformity to the image of Christ. That's good. You say, that's not my definition of good. My definition of good is that things work out the way I want them to work out. Where your good is different than God's good. God's good is sometimes things aren't going to work out the way you want them to. But he's going to make you more like Christ because of it. That's God's good. And so, are you accepting the circumstances that you're in? Now, I, I, I have something with me today. And... Uh, I snuck it over here. I knew that I didn't, I didn't have dinner today, and I knew I'd be hungry. And so, um, I hope you don't mind, but uh, I picked up a nice, delicious biscuit. 
don't tell pastor. You're not supposed to eat in here. But I like biscuits, man. I like them. How many are like me? You like good buttermilk biscuits. Anybody like them? Hey, I, I have a couple of them here. How many want the other one? Anybody want the other one? Where? Come on down. You're the next contestant on The Price is Right. No, I'll take this guy over here. I saw a hand over there. Yeah, come over here. Come up here. Yes, sir. You like biscuits, right? You like, do you like butter on them? How do you like them? You like them with butter? You have them anyway. You like jelly on them? Jelly's good. How about honey? I like butter and honey. It's the best. Are you ready? I got one for you. You ready for it? All right. First off, I want you to start eating that. That flour is gluten-free because my wife could use that later on. Gluten-free. No, you, you said you like biscuits, right? This is not biscuits. No, I, I, I guarantee I have that in here. My, my biscuit has that. So you start eating that, and then this is delicious. Baking soda. You are going to love that. You're going to get tall. It helps you grow. It really, it's good stuff. This is, a, this is a kicker. You like the butter, the buttermilk biscuits, right? This is cultured buttermilk blend. You add water to it. Try that, man. It's delicious. Man, enjoy, enjoy your biscuit. All right, let's give him a hand. All right. Hey, come back here. Come back here. I'll trade you. Let me make sure I, didn't, I don't give you the one I bit. You don't want the one I bit. No, this is the one I didn't bit. I will trade you. You put it here. You can eat this. I promise you it's been here since I started preaching, so it's stale. But go ahead and have that. Enjoy it. It's all good. All right. Did you get what I did there? How, how, many, how many get the illustration there? We like the outcome. We don't always like the ingredients. We like what God does with the ingredients. You know, the Bible doesn't say that all things are good to them that love God. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says all things work together. You mix it. You blend it. They're, they're, they're ingredients. You put it in the oven. God cooks it up, and it's delicious. Not all things in your life are good. An abusive relationship isn't good. Abusive parents are not good. Getting stolen from is not good. Filing bankruptcy is not good. Having uh, bad health is not good. None of that's good. The Bible never says your life is going to only be good things. The Bible says God can take those things, though, and he can make something good out of them. See the difference? You don't like the flour by itself. You don't like the buttermilk by itself. You don't like all those things by themselves. But when you put them together, they work towards something good. Delicious biscuits, right? And so that's what God is teaching. Uh, going back to Gian, Gianna Jen, Jensen, Jensen, I'm sorry. She survives a saline abortion. That's a miracle. There's not an abortion doctor, which I still don't think that's the right name, there to end her life. So there is a nurse that takes her to another hospital. Do you see the, the hand of God in that? Do you see God working in that? Do you see God? And, and, and he does this because God says, you know what? I need someone to survive that so she can go tell people how wrong it is. And so I'm going to design her, and I'm going to let her go through this, and I'm going to take all those things so I have somebody that will represent how evil this is before the world. And God does that. He works everything for his purpose and for his glory. And, and, and uh, Deanna Justin, I remember she said this. She said, I have cerebral palsy as a result. I have, to, I, I have to walk with braces. I, have, I, 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 I can't walk straight. She said, and it's one of the greatest gifts God ever given me. She calls that a gift in her life. Why? Because she recognizes the hand of God. She's poor in spirit. And God has given her great riches as a result. You know, abundance is God working in our lives to conform us to the image of Christ. Embrace the negative. Embrace the trials. Embrace the failures. Embrace the difficulties. Embrace the heartaches and the disappointments. Embrace the corrections that people have to give you in life. They are working together. This is mentioned about the Apostle Paul. The Bible says, but the Lord said unto him, I'm talking to Ananias, he says, go thy way. For Paul, he, Paul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So God says, I have a purpose for him. And then he defines his ministry. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. 
You say, like Paul, he suffered a lot. He was beaten and shipwrecked and everything else you can imagine. Uh, the Bible says, I've got ministry for him. It's a suffering ministry. If I said, we're going to start a team today, ministry today, who would like to volunteer for the suffering ministry? How many would be like, oh boy, that sounds great. That was Paul, that's a title of Paul's ministry, that he's going to suffer. Now, if the abundant life looked like what we want it to look like, then the apostle Paul's life would make no sense. Most of the lives of people in the Bible would make no sense at all if, if the good that God works things to, towards is what we think they should be. God's definition is different than ours. The third question is, are you accepting God's will? No, humility looks to God for every need. If you need nothing but God, then nothing and no one is a threat to you. I'm worried he's going to get my position. That's all right, God's in control. I'm worried that they're going to be liked more than me. That's all right, God's in control. I'm worried that I'm going to lose this to that person. That's okay, God's in control. And if you lose that, then you're just, you're just following God's will. You're, just, you're still in God's hand. So if you need nothing but God, then no one's a threat to you. You should have the attitude that rich or poor, liked or unliked, healthy or sick, I am happy with God's will. I have a friend of mine that in college, um, right, right before he went to college, uh, he went to a basketball game. Uh, I, I can't remember if it was a college game or, or an NBA game. Um, but they told him, he said, they said, Chris, uh, his, his ticket won a raffle. They called him up. They, they said, this is what you have to do. You have to make a layup, then you have to make a a uh, free shot, then you have to make a three-point shot, and then you have to make a half court, and you have a minute. And, and, and Chris is not a great basketball player. He's not terrible, but he's not great. And he did all of those things and got a brand new truck out of it. God's good, right? Went through college, that truck was a great help to him. Got out of college, crashed the truck, and lost it. And God is still good. When you win the truck, God's great. When you lose the truck, God's great. Sometimes if we don't come, up, come to the place in our, in our prayer life, in our Bible study, God's going to have to take it through, to, to us in different ways. God's going to have to take us there through trials and through difficulties. And if he does, praise him through the trials. Let them humble you. Let them accomplish the purpose they were designed to accomplish. I'm going to get to the second point, and probably not to the third point because of time, but I want to notice that we are to delight in being poor in spirit. The attitude is the opposite of the word's philosophy of get all you can and can all you get. The word blessed means sacred delight. It means happy. Someone uh, says, how can I be happy by surrendering my will to Christ when God's will is a trial? You do that by embracing the negative. Embracing the negative. Humility is Christ-like. The more we understand and yield, yield to the poor in spirit uh, uh, mentality of humility, the more we become like Christ. Psalm 113, 5 and 6, Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high, who humbleth himself, to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. God humbles himself. Philippians 2, 8, being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What was Jesus doing when he became an infant, born in a manger, when the infinite became an infant? What was he doing when he suffered shame, when he hung there naked on the cross? What was he doing when he was tortured and mocked and killed for you and I? He was showing humility. And I hope you're in church today because you want to be more like Christ. If so, Christ is humble. Humility makes us kings. Look at verse number three. The Bible says in Matthew chapter uh, five, verse three, which the wind has blown away. There we are. Um, the Bible says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We are kings. We reign in life by submitting to the authority of Jesus. No one deserves authority in life until they submit to authority. Until they submit to God's authority in their life. When Saul was humble, God gave him the kingdom. When he became prideful, God took it away from him, gave it to David. The world thinks authority comes from skill, from knowledge, from self-promotion. The true authority comes from poverty in our spirit. Pride makes you a slave. You're, you're bound to promote yourself. But humility allows God to promote you. I want to notice the development of a humble spirit. 
once you think you have humility, you don't. I want you to read my book on how to become humble like me, right? I always find it fascinating that the phrase Moses, the meekest man who ever lived, I'm not, I'm not quoting it perfectly, was pinned down by Moses. I always find that, that humorous. <laughs> that would be like me writing down, Alan Waddell, the meekest man who ever lived. You know, but praise the Lord, we know that the Holy Spirit led him to that. It wasn't Moses. But um, we develop a Holy Spirit. Remember your condition. I'm a sinner. Don't get, you cannot impress NASA with a paper airplane, can you? Look. You don't impress Picasso with a child's crayon drawing. You don't impress God either by your good works, your amazing intellect, any other ability you have. You're not going to impress the God who created everything with anything you have. Hate to break it to you. Paul had incredible leadership, very best education, oratory skills, abilities that most of us will never have. He was rising in rank. People were applauding him. And Paul said, all of that is dung. That's his wording. Philippians 3, 7, and 8. But what things were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, who, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but dung that I may win Christ. Remember your condition. I'm a sinner. Yield daily to the word. Matthew 4, 4 tells us to do that. I won't look at it right now, but Matthew 4, 4 tells us to be daily in the word. And then focus on Christ. Not on our failures or successes. Remember your condition. I'm a sinner. Yield daily to the word of God. Focus on Christ. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Where for seeing we also are compassed about with so, so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience. The race is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus. And lastly, we serve others. Galatians 5.13, for brethren, ye have been called into liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Now, here's the key about service. You don't have to wait to be put into a ministry. You can serve somebody today. I, the past week, I've been served by a lot of people. Chip McGrath, it amazes me how much Chip does for others. Josh Cortez, Pastor and Vicky. I met a guy that, that came in and, and, and started doing the plumbing. And I talked to him for a little while. He had a good, and I thought, I know this guy from somewhere. And I walked out and I walked back in and I said, you're Bill Howard. He said, how do you know? I said, because you are your son. I've never met two people more alike than Bill Howard and Billy. <laughs> I've never in my life. I said, he's got to be. If he's not your son, uh, then, then nobody is, is his dad. I mean, I mean you've got to be it. And Clarence. Ed, tons of others from First Baptist of Ruskin. We had a lot of people yesterday who helped us move in, and, and we are so thankful for that. And you didn't even need to be assigned a ministry or given a title or recognition to do it. You just did it. That's Christianity. Isaiah 66, 2. The life God blesses, the life of surrender. For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look. He says, this is the kind of man that I will look upon, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. God blesses those that are poor in spirit. Father, we thank you so much for the goodness of your word and the truth of your word, Father. Help us to apply it to our lives and our hearts today, Father. And we do pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time... Brother Robert O'Neill is going to come. He'll sing the first verse of invitation. Let's stand. He'll sing the first verse of invitation. When he is done, we'll sing the second. If God is speaking to your heart in any way, if God is dealing with you, we invite you to come. If your desire is to join a good church, let me tell you, this is a good church. Today would be a great day to do that. Maybe you're, maybe you're saved, but you've never been baptized. Maybe there's something you're struggling with in your life. You know, God invites you to cast those cares upon him, for he cares for you. Whatever it may be, if God's speaking to your heart. I've decided to follow Jesus. I have decided Jesus, I have decided.
decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back, I have, still I will Thank you for that message, but what's most important is that we learn how to apply it to ourselves. We can walk out of here and say, wow, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Great message, Brother Waddell, and then walk out of here and never remember one thing was said. So let me encourage you, apply the things that you learned. It is good that we should be poor in the spirit. Great message, and you know what? Jesus put it in there for a reason. He spoke it to the Sermon on the Mount, and what a great reminder of poor in the spirit. Don't forget, no Wednesday night service this week. And enjoy your time on Thursday with your family. Josh Irish, would you close us in prayer? All right, let's pray. God, our Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that um, you left it there as a road map for us to be able to follow you well. We pray that, um, as Brother Jim said, that we would absorb it, that we would use it and apply it to our lives um, this week and every week. We thank you for... For just revealing yourself to us um, anytime we'll look. And we just ask God that you would keep us tender and that we would always look. We pray that you'd protect us this week, Lord. Go with us, we uh, go about our week. Help us to look for ways, um, like Brother Allen said, where we can be the hands and feet of Christ. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. <laughs>